The people that create genre-defining video games aren't always the same people that go on to decide what that genre should actually be called. Think back to the early 90s, a time when most first-person shooters were still referred to simply as Doom clones, or more recently with the explosion of the MOBA genre. If you look at the early marketing for Dota 2, Valve would never call it that, they'd never call it a MOBA. Instead, they preferred action, real-time strategy game. And, well, I can't remember the last time anyone actually called it that because inevitably, it's the audience that decides. And with that in mind, let's talk about walking simulators. If you haven't heard this term before, it's typically used when referring to games that prioritize either story or atmosphere above all else. The player can usually explore the environment they're in, but the interactions within that environment are fairly limited. Examples include Dear Esther, Gone Home, and Proteus. Now, the interesting thing about the words walking simulator, God, you know it's a Eurogamer video when you hear a sentence like that one, the interesting thing about the words walking simulator is that they come from such a dismissive place. Back in 2012, when Dear Esther first appeared as something that you could actually buy, no longer a mod, but a fully-fledged video game on Steam, the reaction was mixed. It reviewed well, and we're going to sell hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies, but it started a fairly aggressive debate, one that still exists today. You see, its critics would claim that Dear Esther wasn't truly a game, the player's input was just too limited. There were no puzzles to solve, no systems to master, you were simply walking your way through someone else's story. To them, this was just a walking simulator. Okay, four and a half years on from that release, Dear Esther has now made its way over to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and we spoke with the game's developers, the Chinese Room, as they were recording a new director's commentary for this re-release. And yeah, let's start with the inevitable, shall we? Years later, how do they feel about that whole what makes a video game conversation that they unknowingly sparked all the way back in 2012? You can tell they enjoyed that question. We were modders, we came out of the mod community. Mm. It was never a question whether it was a game or not. And if you looked at the mod community then, which then kind of, I guess, kind of mutated a bit into the indie community, it was so wide, it was so diverse, people were trying sort of all sorts of different stuff. They were going completely crazy with what you could do with the tech. And for me, kind of like that goes right back to the early days of Doom modding. We had some sort of crazy stuff coming out. And just, I think diversity can only be a good thing. The broader range of games you've got on the market for the broadest number of people can only be a good thing. There's no, I can't see a single argument where having less games or less different types of games can be bad for games. So it just, I don't know, it's always kind of been a bit water off a duck's back to me because I kind of go, well, no one's putting a gun to your head and forcing you to play Dear Esther if you don't want to. And it's pretty obvious what it is in the same way that the only time there's a problem is when stuff is missold to people. And I don't think we've ever been guilty of that. It's less the kind of the question, the academic thing of, of is it a game or isn't it a game? What really matters is, is it something which you enjoy and has been made well and, and is, is kind of there's an honesty about what it is in, in your relationship with it as a player so does it matter if it's a game or not I think if it's and like, gaming's wide enough and, and the gaming community is big enough that if you don't happen to think these types of games are games then fine don't play them sure. fortunately we're really lucky and then the other companies that make things similar to us are lucky that there's a hell of a lot of people out there who do think they're games and do want to play them and they're the people that you really you know I, I think I don't want to have to compromise what we do to try and appeal to a market that are inherently not interested in what we do. What really matters is making the best possible thing for the types of people who want to play that type of game. We make niche products, but actually there's enough people that feel passionately about them to keep us afloat commercially. We don't have to appeal to every gamer out there. So I think that was, if anything, we learned from that. It was that confidence to say we can make what we want to make and an, an audience will always find that and want that. But surely it must be frustrating to find that the same debate is seemingly unresolved more than four years later. What's really amazing to me is that um, Alex Graham, who's one of our amazing artists at the Chinese Room, she's fantastic, and she went to, I think it was Res last year, and she said, I went to 10 talks and she said, four or five of them referenced Dear Esther in their talks. And that was a massive moment for me where I thought, this is now properly embedded within the industry and within the community. It's something that people still talk about. And in an industry that has an incredibly fast turnover and an incredibly short attention span quite a lot of the time, 
I think that feels for me one of the biggest achievements of the game that we made together is that it's something that st people still feel is relevant. Mm -hmm. That you know, even though it can be slightly frustrating that people are talking about, is this a game? Is it art? Can games be art? Mm -hmm. It did start those conversations, and they're conversations that weren't necessarily happening, particularly often before we made the game. So yeah, I think to have made something with longevity in this industry feels like a massive achievement, actually. Yeah. So this re-release is likely to introduce Dear Esther to a new audience all over again. Are they expecting a similar response this time around? We got so much heat from when Dear Esther came out and it was just like, what the hell is this? Who are you people? Why? Mm -hmm. uh, but now I feel like I'm hoping that it's going to be a lot, a lot more easier to, to kind of market the game and um, explain it to people. But I, I, I agree. And yet I disagree. Really? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> because I kind of think the games industry needs to be challenged, actually. It needs... I think this game probably still will be out of their comfort zone for a lot of people, and that's OK. I think one of the things I'm really proud of is that Dear Esther did challenge the, those preconceptions of what a game is and what they're for and what they're about and what gameplay, you know, what function gameplay has. So, yes, I'm kind of... I think it yeah. is coming into a much more knowledgeable, softer market, but I also think, I hope it it's still challenges and provokes. It's and still excites. more extreme, actually, it, you know, like, the arrestor is definitely a more extreme. Yeah, I think version. linguistically it's still, yeah, like, it's pretty uncomfortable. very poetic and yeah, challenging. Like, yeah. we, we just designed it to be as extreme as possible in all of those areas. So, like, I love the idea of talking so about the as an extreme thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> extreme walking. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extreme walking simulator. But despite all this drama, the Chinese room would go on to make another game with a similar kind of idea. It's a, all about story and atmosphere, this time set in a 1980s English town that you potter around in. A game that some people would once again go on to call a walking simulator, and not in a nice way. Let's end with a good one. Why is this the type of game that this team wants to make? Why is it worth all that hassle? So, uh, for me, what games, what I love about games, and whether that's Shadow of the Colossus, whether that's Far Cry Primal, which is getting a lot of playtime at the moment, being in the world is what games do. That sense where I can't, I always go back to that. I remember I had quite a break from gaming because so I was unemployed and I couldn't employ a PC or console or anything like that. And I borrowed a PlayStation from a friend and put Tomb Raider 3 in about halfway through the first level, just sat there and went, I can't believe I'm in this world. And I get like, I'm like seven years old when I have those moments. And it's about that, it's about going, we have this amazing opportunity to spin these worlds and to put you in the world and go, off you go. And that to me is, that's what we can do in this medium more than yeah. any other medium. And that's what's so exciting about games. So yeah, absolutely. I want, you know, I want to make worlds where you just feel like completely giddy with that of just going I'm here and I can go and I can look at this and I can explore that and that's yeah that's what it's all about I think and that's what it's been about I think in in all of the other games we've done and I think that's what will carry on in terms of the games we're doing it's always going to be about that sense of I'm here and there we are thank you very much for watching and thanks once again to the Chinese room for having a chat with us midway through their director's commentary recording I think we did actually interrupt it you know when we arrived you had to walk down some stairs and stairs were really creaky and oh god I hope they didn't have to re-record any lines because of that sorry sorry about that uh, if you enjoyed this video you might like these ones that I've just popped on the screen or perhaps you'd like to subscribe for more stuff just like this in the future see you next time bye